of the Seattle Answer Coalition, which stands for Act Now to Stop War and End Racism. And I'm really glad to see everyone here today loud, proud, and unintimidated. Because you may know, about two weeks ago, the FBI raided the homes of some peace and solidarity activists in Minneapolis and Chicago, and they're going to be holding some grand jury witch hunts this coming week. And we are here to say that they are not going to shut down our movement. We are here today to mark the beginning of the 10th year of the U.S. occupation of Afghanistan and to demand that the U.S. get out now. Nine years ago, there were some people who thought that the U.S. war in Afghanistan was somehow justified by the 9-11 attacks. The Answer Coalition organized the first national demonstrations against that war, and we say the war was wrong then, and it's still wrong now. In fact, U.S. intervention in Afghanistan goes a long way back before 2001. In 1979, the U.S. started funding the so-called Mujahideen, including forces that were led by Osama bin Laden, and they were fighting against a progressive government in Afghanistan, a government that promoted literacy and women's rights, and they were fighting it with our tax dollars. Today, after nine years of U.S. war and occupation, the war is spreading to neighboring Pakistan with drone attacks and the number of deaths, both among the U.S. military and among Afghan civilians, is on the rise. In fact, more U.S. soldiers have died in Afghanistan under the Obama administration than all the soldiers who died there during the Bush administration put together. Today you hear people who might say that the U.S. has no choice but to, quote, stay the course in Afghanistan. We say the U.S. needs to get out of Afghanistan now. And we need to let the Afghan people determine their own destiny. We say, take the money that is being spent on the colonial occupation in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Palestine, that is being spent on drone attacks and military aid to Pakistan, Yemen, Colombia, and all too many other countries, too many to mention. Take that money and we could feed the hungry. We could eliminate homelessness. We could create a real health care program and provide quality education from kindergarten to grad school, and so much more. End the wars now! All right, we have a really awesome program. I'm just going to start calling people up. Anton, you want to come on up? We have Anton Black from the Vietnam Veterans Against the War Anti-Imperialist. Please give him a warm welcome. Hi, y'all. This, uh, like Jane mentioned, this Afghan war has gone on way too long. It needs to be stopped now. The system is not going to do it because the system is based on war, oppression, mass murder. We need to get the troops out of Afghanistan. We need to get the U.S. troops out of the whole world. They're enforcing a murderous system by murderous means. And this must be stopped now. The government, the political system won't do it. We need mass resistance to do it. That's the only thing that's going to stop. People are resisting in the countries under attack, under invasion. We need to unite with people all over the world to put an end to this U.S. imperialist monster. What we have to say is no U.S. troops anytime, anywhere. Support GI resistance. Thank you. All right, thank you, Anton. We have another speaker right now. We're very lucky to happy to have him here, Nate Martin. He's with the uh, Nicholsville, so please give him a warm welcome from Nicholsville. Good afternoon. I'm speaking on behalf of Nicholsville, and I would like to begin by thanking the Veterans for Peace Chapter 92 for aiding in the efforts of Nicholsville, where a homeless veteran like myself can find a safe community to rest. I'm a veteran of the United States Army, honorably discharged, and here I am. Without Nicholsville, without Nicholsville, backed by the Veterans for Peace, I would be walking the streets, falling further into that hole called despair. Underfunded and understaffed, the VA hospitals and transition centers are deplorable alternatives where disease and parasites run rampant. So I live in an encampment with a dozen other veterans and a plethora of unfortunates, and I'm one of the lucky ones. I often ask myself, what is the price for peace? I'm told that to defend peace, we must wage war. 
or that she was of countless good men and women, sons and daughters of this great nation, friends and neighbors. A single life in and of itself is a steep price to pay, and these are the lucky ones. They will never have to see their mothers cry when they receive the news. They never have to witness the empty chair at the next party. They never see their they will never see their children grow up, and they are the lucky ones. The soldiers returning home after the hell they go through are returning broken and abused. Even when they return whole of body, they still don't have the support to reintegrate back into society. That support goes back into the war, any war. Resources that can educate, house, and heal people like myself and my neighbors are being funneled into a killing field. At what price freedom? At what cost peace? To fuel the war, it's entirely too high. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we'd like to hear from Mike Tavana. Are you here? All right, Mike. We have Mike Tavana from Eastside Fellowship of Reconciliation. Glad to be here today. Thanks for coming out. U.S. out of Afghanistan. U.S. out of North America. To say that this war in Afghanistan makes our country safe is bullshit, right? It doesn't make us any safer. We've been in there for nine years, spending lots of money and shedding a lot of blood, and I think it creates more terrorism, not less terrorism. So that's, that's bullshit. I was asked to speak today about the cost of war in Afghanistan, and I think there's three principles. Um, engaged here. The cost of money, the cost of our humanity, and the cost of our lives. Now the cost of money, how many people here pay federal taxes? Wow. Well, you know, that tax money falls into one of the cornerstones of capitalism. It takes money to make money. And who's making the money? Boeing, Raytheon, Halliburton, Blackwater. There's over 26,000 private military contractors in Afghanistan right now wreaking havoc and terror amongst all those people there. It's time to bring the contractors home. Bring the contractors home, cut off their money. The money goes to the war machine, we know that, but what happens here at home? At the same time, we were coming up with $20 billion to give missiles to Israel to fight their war with Lebanon, and they call them the Patriot missiles. We were losing 12 elementary schools here in Seattle at $15 million. That's 15 Patriot missiles. I mean, it takes just a little bit of this money to make us prosperous. But we have more potholes in the roads, more weeds, more garbage, everything. It just gets life, the quality of our lives is going down. And, and the question of our humanity. When I saw a picture of a 10-year-old boy weeping because in Afghanistan because he'd just become an orphan, my heart broke, and I cried for I don't know how long. I'm still weeping. That takes away a part of my and your humanity. And when I saw a family in Afghanistan eating grass soup to survive, putting grass and water just to survive, because we had bombed their irrigation canals, my humanity suffered for that. War is hell. War is not buying us our freedom. It's taking away our humanity. And as far as our lives go, do you know that the Navy is now about to test for a second time in our skies and off our uh, beaches? Sonar, depleted uranium, uh, weather weapons, jet fuel emissions, uh, chemtrails. And that falls on us. We are the testing ground for the Navy's war weapons. That, we're paying for this war with our lives. You get that? All right. It's time to rethink Afghanistan. As far as Obama goes, Obama is Bush. 
on steroids. And they call this war in Afghanistan, Operation Enduring Freedom. I think it's Operation Enduring Bullshit Propaganda. How much of this propaganda can we handle? So what's the solution? The solution is simple. That I started protesting in the 70s, 1970. And what we did then, we need to do now. And that's Occupy. A few of your elders here, when they call out for, for a protest, they go occupy things. We need to occupy without permits. We didn't even think of getting a permit back then. It didn't, the concept didn't even exist. So, so you have to go occupy Washington, D.C., occupy the White House, occupy the, the calls of Congress, occupy all the seats of government. Every, rec every revolution in, in, in recent history, Bolivia, Venezuela, Ecuador, they occupied the presidential palace. Go occupy something and we'll get this country back. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Why don't we all chant a little bit? Bring the troops home now. 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 All right, thank you. How about we hear from Ann Paxton? Are you here? All right, come on up. We have Ann Paxton from Voices of Palestine. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you. I'm with Voices of Palestine. I want to. On behalf of Voices of Palestine, I want to express our solidarity with the, Cal the Seattle anti-war movement. And I just want to make three points. First, the, okay. the world is awakening to the reality of the oppression of Palestinians by Israel. With the indiscriminate slaughter of Operation Cast Lead in December 2008 and January 2009, with the Free Gaza and Viva Palestina convoys, which were um, bravely made it to Gaza with humanitarian relief, and recently with the Gaza Freedom Flotilla hijacked in international waters with nine of its members murdered by Israeli commandos, millions more people are understanding the terrible injustice that has been wreaked on Palestine by for 62 years since the creation of Israel. In America there is still a big knowledge gap. A tiny minority here understand that not a single country on the planet outside of Israel accepts the legality of Israeli settlements. But in Europe a large percentage of people understand that Israel's continuing occupation of the West Bank, the blockade of Gaza, the racist laws, ethnic cleansing and daily humil humiliation of Palestinians add up to one thing, a war of extermination against the Palestinian people. The second point is concerning the charade of peace talks now taking place under the sponsorship of a very dishonest broker, the United States. I recently had the opportunity to hear Ali Abu Nima, the founder of Electronic Intifada, speaking in Olympia. He gave this wonderful metaphor comparing the peace talks to two people sitting down trying to divide a piece of pizza when one person suddenly starts gobbling the pizza and all the while saying to the other, what's the problem? We're still negotiating. So some of us now refer to the negotiations as the Middle East pizza talks. That's the best way to understand what's going on in Israel and Palestine with the Israeli settlements and to appreciate just how dim the prospects for peace really are. Third is the campaign for boycott, divestment, and sanctions launched against Israel at the request of Palestinians in 2005 is beginning to have an effect. Internationally, we're seeing refusals to offload Israeli ships. We're seeing a cancellation of contracts with Israeli companies. Increasing numbers of college campuses and pension funds are supporting divestment. And right here in Washington State, our own Olympia Food Co-op co was the first to adopt a boycott of Israeli goods. Voices of Palestine is 
Seattle based, we're all volunteer. And we try to bring these issues to the public's attention through weekly vigils, through demonstrations, and hosting of speakers like Ken O'Keefe, who was here last week, a survivor of the Mavi Marmara massacre of the Gaza Freedom Flotilla, who has received very little attention from the press. We support Palestinian self-determination, ending the occupation, equal rights for all in historic Palestine, the right of return for Palestinian refugees, and establishment of a sovereign, independent, and democratic state of Palestine with Jerusalem as its capital. And we continue to work to make these goals a reality. Thank you. The guy who's just walking by and he was yelling, treason, treason, he's absolutely right. Given the political climate of our time, given the political climate of our politics, what we are about here is treason in their eyes and yet faithful to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. The battle we have ahead of us to reconvert, if you will, America back to its roots and back to its idealisms is huge. And so let me start, let me start just with a little biblical story. You might remember this. It's a story of a of a of a small, weeny, teeny little guy, a shepherd boy named Davy. And he uh, goes up against the latest, greatest, most magnificently dressed, technologically sophisticated, weaponized giant of a man, Goliath. And so they go and they do battle, and everybody knows that Goliath is going to stomp all over Davy. I mean, there's no question about it. But then, in the midst of the battle, or actually before the battle begins, Davy looks down, and he sees some smooth stones, and he picks them up, and he puts them in a slingshot, and he whips it around, and this low-tech intervention lands on Goliath's head, who falls down dead. You and I, you and me, especially, I mean, look around, look at, look at how few of us there are. We're Davy, and we have to understand when we go back into our homes and our neighborhoods and our networks that we're Davy. We're not Goliath. The American people are not with us. The American people are asleep. And even though the polls are saying, come home America and bring our troops back, the polls, the people are asleep. And how do we wake them up? We're Davy, and we don't have much. And we don't have a political party that gives a damn about the soldiers. Neither political party cares about the people who are actually doing the fighting. We don't have political power to stop the thieves that are gutting our budgets and our economic policy is rooted in our military policy. We don't have a media that projects a counter message to um, resist the fascist Republican Party and the fascist wing of the Christian Church that is dominating the media in this country. We don't have a powerful national labor movement to stop corporations from cutting our wages. We don't have much, but we do have each other, and that's what I want to just talk about just for a few minutes today. Times are tough, and things look really, really bleak. But it also looked bleak at the beginning of the 20th century when a skinny, nearly naked man led a movement that brought down the all-powerful British Empire in India. And it also looked bleak in segregated Alabama until a preacher led a movement that brought down the apartheid structures of this nation. It looked bleak when the almighty South African Empire crushed their own citizens, but the citizens eventually prevailed, led by a man who had been locked away for some 20 years. And it looked bleak all across Eastern Europe until a nonviolent move of the people brought down the Soviet Union. Times are tough, and it does look bleak, but empires fall, empires rot, 
empires get dismantled. History is full of the corpses of empire, and today we're here as Davies to announce in the face of some contrary evidence that the empire of money that has imprisoned us into a culture of permanent war, of government by bribe, of heartless cruelty to the poor, this empire of money that has shred the Declaration of Independence and made a mockery of our Constitution, this empire of money will not stand. It will fall as sure as Goliath fell to David. This empire of money has unleashed class warfare pitting us against each other when the only people we should be pitted against are the billionaires who are leading this war against us. This empire has morally corrupted us through continual torture and the rampant murder of civilians both in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now we're into robotic war with Pakistan. We have built over 800 military bases around the world. We're rattling swords against nation after nation which is sucking out our national treasure. This empire of money is an abomination in the sight of God and it is a blasphemy against the American spirit that once so proudly said, give me your poor, your tired, your huddled masses yearning to be free. You are here because you believe in that America. Don't forget that as times are tough and things look bleak, there's a few of us today, the next time there needs to be double and double and double and piece by piece, brick by brick, step by step, we will bring this empire down, we will restore American values because this is the true patriotism when we all belong together in a world of peace, in a world of prosperity for all, where a person has the right to eat and to sleep under a roof and a right, a right to assemble together. Don't forget who you are, American citizens. We've got, some, we've got a couple of important announcements. One is Phil West. You need to meet behind the stage with Lieutenant Munson. Please, Phil West. Paging Phil, please go back and meet with Lieutenant Munson. Another one is, okay, are you still fired up? Are you still fired up? Are you ready to take the next step? All right, so one of the next steps is that if you think of us, as an army for peace with justice, how does an army travel? It travels on its belly. We need to have some volunteers come forth. You know who you are. They're going to come amongst you and circulate the white buckets. So this is a way that you can put your money where your mouth is, literally put it in the bucket. This will help pay for expenses such as the sound system, publicity, permits, etc. that are necessary and will give us a foundation for the next demonstration because there will be a next demonstration. We need to keep this movement going and the only way that's going to happen, there are no corporate sponsors. Boeing did not give us a grant to organize this rally. Are you surprised? No. Okay. Bucket people, go forth and do your thing. And we have a special treat here. The uh, members, a group of singers from the Seattle Labor Chorus, not the entire chorus, but a group of them are going to sing some songs, and they are some songs that you probably know and can join in on. So this is going to be a participatory uh, part of our rally. So we encourage you to uh, join in with them and give them a warm welcome. Thank you so much.
guys. All right. As you said, we're, <clears throat> we're a group of singers from the Seattle Labor Course. We've got a pretty good representation here. We couldn't get quite enough people from all our sections to do an actual performance. So we're going to make all of you honorary members of the Seattle Labor Chorus for today and um, ask you to sing along with us when you can. This first song, uh, the chorus will come around a number of times. It's an easy chorus to pick up and uh, you can dance to it too. So it was written by a guy named Gary Poe in the 1970s and we really like the song we keep updating the verses to keep up with changing circumstances. If you want to get wise, open up your eyes, stick out your ears and listen. If you don't feel the heat, then I must repeat, there's something you've been missing. The newspaper today said everything's okay. Well, that's just hopeful dream and idle wishing. Between the lines you'll find friction in the system Just a little friction, friction in the system And I am believing it's you and me and the rest of the folks in town Without a government we cannot depend They tell us that we must push on. It's a necessary war, and we've heard that before. And the killing just goes on and on. When will they ever admit what we already know? This is a resource war, and we're the only superpower. In the belly of the beast, we must work for peace. So raise your voices in this dark hour and sing with us. of us see. With 50,000 troops there and mercenaries to spare, occupation is what's meant to be. Of course we understand our oil's still under their sand. So we'll con privatize this war, contract it out for the long haul. It's a corporate dream and it's gathering steam. We got to stop it so the heat our call and make a little friction. Friction in the system. We're gonna turn it around. And I am believing it's you and me and the rest of the folks in town. We got. This next song was written by Carol Denny, from the, who comes from the Bay Area, and uh, she wrote it about the uh, banking crisis, the banking bailout, the financial mess that we're in, and she calls the song, Where'd the Money Go? Uh, a lot of very clever verses, but one thing she didn't address in this song is the relationship of our crisis to that untouchable subject, which is the military budget. And so um, 
Ruth Yarrow. Black hole. And I made some changes to the song. Ruth changed the refrain around a little bit, make it a little less humorous, a little darker, but I hope you'll sing it. And here's the way the song goes. Here, here's the refrain. Here's your part. Where'd the money, where'd the money, where'd the money go? The money went to foreign lands to kill folks we don't know. Try that. Where'd the money, where'd the money, where'd the money go? The money went to foreign lands to kill folks we don't know. It takes a million bucks to send one soldier off to war. But I can think of better things to spend that money for. Housing, health care, education, just to name a few. Let's keep those billions here at home and see what we can do. Oh, where the money, where the money, where the money go? The money sizes grow and oil wells blow, our health care's gone to pot. They still say the banks are too big to fail, how come our schools are not? Oh, where the money, where the money, where the money go? The money went to foreign lands to kill folks we don't know. Our dollars go to other lands where drones and bombers roam. Civilians die and mothers cry. Let's bring those bucks back home. Oh, where the money, where the money, where the money go? The money went to foreign lands to kill folks we don't know. The military's grown obese and they always ask for more. They're spending in the trillions now. It's time to say no more. Oh, Maybe someday, we can only hope, but someday a majority of members in Congress will support Dennis Kucinich's proposal that at the cabinet level in Washington, D.C., I guess they're not. I guess at the cabinet level that there be established a Department of Peace so that finally we can research and study ways to be world peacemakers and maybe except for historical purposes we will study war no more. I'm gonna lay down my sword and sheath down by the riverside. Some of you sing it, so let's sing. I'm gonna shake hands around the world.
Hi, how are we doing here? All right. Let's give it up for the members and the, the group of singers formerly known as the Seattle, no, the group of singers known as the Seattle Labor Chorus from the Seattle Labor Chorus. It's a great, great resource for our community. They did an amazing job at the collateral repair uh, fundraiser uh, back in the summer. Really beautiful singing. So with a very powerful, powerful message. So our next speaker, uh, is he ready to come on up? We have James, who's a member of the Seattle Anti-Imperialist Committee, and he'll be uh, speaking to us now. Please give him uh, your full attention. After nine years, it should be clear to... Closer? Is that better? Okay. After nine years, it should be clear to everyone that the American ruling class used the 9-11 terrorist atrocity as the excuse to step up its own atrocities globally. This has meant the deaths of tens and thousands of Afghans, hundreds of thousands of Iraqis, and laying waste to their countries. Obama continues on this path with record war budgets, proclaiming the right to assassinate anyone on earth, keeping 48,000 troops in Iraq, and escalating and expanding the war in Afghanistan. And the aims of that war are to carve out and defend a U.S. sphere of influence in Central Asia against imperialist rivals. At the heart of this imperialist project is solidifying the rule of the Karzai government of drug lords, warlords, and fundamentalists over the Afghan masses. Progressive humanity stands for the defeat of the U.S. in this bloody project. This does not mean supporting reactionaries like the fundamentalist Taliban. It means going all out to support the secularist and democratic uh, Afghans who are striving to fight both the foreign invaders as well as Afghan reactionaries of all stripes. It means going all out to support the hundreds and hundreds of protests by ordinary Afghans demanding that the U.S. get out of their country. To give our Afghan sisters and brothers the kind of support they need means fighting to build the anti-war movement in this country in conscious solidarity with them. Nine years have shown that this is a long-term struggle, but it has good prospects. In 21 months, the Democrats have shattered the naive beliefs that they are less of a war party than the Republicans. They can't be. The competitive nature of the capitalist system that they represent and defend forces them to be imperialistic. And at home, Obama and company have handed trillions to Wall Street while giving the masses pennies. They're colorblind to racist attacks. Every year they deport more undocumented migrants than Bush ever did. And they're taking Bush's police statism to new levels. As these illusions are shattered, we have the opportunity to build a movement independent of and against the twin parties of war and reaction. A movement, a movement that gets out of control. A movement that links the struggles of the American masses to those of the Afghan masses against our common enemy, U.S. imperialism. Let us use marches like today's to enlighten and draw still more people into action. Let us use them as to build up a movement that targets the imperialist system as a source of modern wars and reaction, and a movement that is consciously building up the class forces to overthrow imperialism in a liberating revolution. Down with Obama's wars! Solidarity with the Afghan and Pakistani peoples! Workers and oppressed peoples of the world, unite! All right, thank you, James. I'd now like to introduce Emma Kaplan from World Can't Wait. Hey, how's everyone doing? All right. So on the ninth anniversary of America, 
America's longest war, the occupations of Afghanistan and Iraq remain bloody, employing more contractors, while drones rain death and destruction upon Pakistan. U.S. courts have ruled that innocents who have been tortured may not sue, while the Obama administration defends those who used torture and authorized it. It has become common knowledge that Barack Obama has ordered the assassination of an American citizen on Wawa Without trial or other judicial proceedings, the administration has simply put him on the to-be-killed list. Whistleblowers in the military have leaked a video showing U.S. troops firing on an unarmed party of Iraqis in 2007. This is the WikiLeaks collateral murder video. They killed two journalists and then they including two children. As ugly as this video was of the killing of the 12 Iraqis, the chatter recorded in the helicopter cockpit is even more monstrous. The Pentagon says there will be no charges against these shoulders and the media absolves them of their blame. In some respects, this is worse than Bush. First, because Obama has claimed the right to assassinate American citizens who he deems as suspects of terrorism, merely on the grounds of his own suspicions or that of the CIA. This was something Bush never publicly claimed. Second, Obama says that the government can detain you indefinitely, even if you've been exonerated in a trial, and he's floated out the idea of preventative detention. Third, the Obama administration is expanding the use of unmanned drone attacks and arguing that the U.S. has the authority under international law to use extrajudicial killing in sovereign countries which are not at war. Such measures by Bush were considered by liberals and progressives to be outrageous and were rightly protested. But these acts, which were considered as anomalies under the Bush regime, have now been consecrated into standard operating procedure by Obama. And so now the question is, what do we do? What do we do now that more war crimes have been exposed? Three days after documents of eight years of war crimes against the, the people of Afghanistan were leaked, what does the U.S. government do when the WikiLeaks came out? Did they admit or apologize for the crimes? They go after the leakers. Did they cut off funding for the war? No, they voted another $59 billion. The massive release of these documents from WikiLeaks or U.S. troops. In the name of the war for empire, everyone here and there is less safe. And just because we already knew this doesn't mean we can snooze on these outrages. No, we've caught them red-handed. Many residents on Friday, July 23rd, a NATO strike killed 52 civilians in the Helmand province. Not in 2004 or in 2006 under Bush, but in mid-2010 under Obama's command. We with this. We got to go out and show this video on every street corner in every city in the whole United States. We need to go into the schools where they're preying on you to get them to join in this military and show this video collateral murder. And that's what we're doing. That's what we've been doing. So people should come up to me and talk to me if you want to do th if you want to do this and be a part of getting the truth out to people. And I want to end in a chant about U.S. out of Afghanistan, out of Iraq and Pakistan, because it is the whole world. U.S. out of Afghanistan, out of Iraq and Pakistan. U.S. out of Afghanistan. U.S. out of Afghanistan, out of Iraq and Pakistan. All right. Thanks, Emma. Thank you. All right.
Our next speaker is Jerry Condon. He is the president of Veterans for Peace, uh, Local 52. BFP 92, uh, speaking of war crimes, have you heard about the uh, arrests and investigation that the Army is doing? Uh, kind of uh, what's been uh, labeled as kind of a renegade squad of soldiers at Fort Lewis, or now called Joint Base Lewis McCord. Uh, these soldiers uh, supposedly were killing innocent Afghan civilians for sport and covering it up and keeping body parts for souvenirs and photographs and you wonder how this kind of thing could take place uh, but the, you know the collateral murder video that Emma just spoke about you can you know that some of the soldiers in that unit said well this may look pretty bad the gunning down of unarmed civilians but we did this every day this was our standard operating procedure um, so when you, the, the Afghan war diaries that were released by WikiLeaks reveal the daily murders of unarmed innocent civilians in Afghanistan and the daily cover-ups of those murders. Uh, so it's not surprising when that's the normal practice that uh, some soldiers would get a little bent and uh, do a little extracurricular killing of their own. Uh, these wars are, you know, one big war crime to begin with, populated by war crimes that go on every single day. So when someone like Bradley Manning comes along, a GI who had the integrity and the courage to apparently uh, leak this information, to leak this video, to let the rest of the world know what was going on in those wars, um, he, he deserves our support, that's for sure. If, if, he, if he's done what the uh, army is accused of him doing, he's a hero uh, and uh, deserves all our support right now. He's the one that's being made the scapegoat. He's the one that's in, in the brig facing court-martial and possible 52 years in prison for telling the truth about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Veterans for Peace is calling on the U.S. government and military to, for the immediate withdrawal of all of our troops, all of the CIA, all of the contractors and mercenaries from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, and from Iraq. <laughs> Veterans for Peace is calling on the uh, U.S. government and the Israeli government to stop their threats to initiate a war against the people of Iran. We're also calling on the Israeli government and their backers in the U.S. to end the siege on the people of Gaza, to stop the occupation of illegal Palestinian lands to stop the oppression of the Palestinian people. And until they do, we will boycott all Israeli products and all Israeli cultural events in this country. Uh, we're calling on Canada to follow the will of your own people and bring your own troops back from Afghanistan and stop threatening to deport U.S. war resistors from Canada. We're calling on the FBI to stop your raids on our peace and solidarity movement. And finally, we're calling on the peace and justice movement itself to unite our various fragmented struggles to come together in one solid peace and justice movement that can organize the majority of people in this country who truly believe in peace and justice and liberty and equality. Uh, Please join us, uh, Veterans for Peace banner over here. We're going to be the leading contingent in the march. You're welcome to join us. We'll also have a Bradley Manning uh, support banner here. You can line up behind because we're going to be blowing the whistle on war crimes. Ow. Blow the whistle. All right. So before we start our
our march, we do have one more really excellent speaker, and I also we have some key announcements. As Jerry said, the uh, veterans, uh, veterans, all different veterans will be leading the march. So if you are a veteran, please check in with the veterans for peace. You will be, uh, if we would like you to be marching up in the front. Um, we'd like to dedicate today's uh, march and rally to three fallen heroes of our movement for peace with justice. Uh, one of them may be less well known to you. His name is Jerry George, and he is a well-known activist on Bainbridge Island. He passed away uh, quite recently, and a number of our friends from Bainbridge are actually occupied today with his memorial service. So uh, Jerry uh, was a, one of the early pioneers of using the internet, using websites and such to publicize and build the anti-war movement. So Jerry George, presente. We'd also like to salute Roberto Maestas. Roberto was the founder of El Centro de la Raza. And for many years, Roberto, of course, struggled for justice in the community against racism and also dedicated resources to the uh, struggle for peace, a global peace all over the world. Every year, El Centro de la Raza has hosted the P Pastors for Peace caravan with Cuba, for instance, and he would lead us in song as he sang, Que lindo es Cuba. So, Roberto Maestas, presente! And finally, a hero of national and international uh, proportions, the Reverend Lucius Walker. Reverend Walker was an important figure in the civil rights movement and then later founded the organization Pastors for Peace, which organized caravans, most notably the caravan to Cuba that, was, that comes through Seattle every year and goes to Cuba in violation of the illegal U.S. and immoral blockade on Cuba. Every year they go and they break the blockade. They carry out a massive act of civil disobedience to bring human, uh, human aid and solidarity to the people of Cuba in violation of the criminal blockade. Reverend Walker passed away about a month ago, and so we'd like to also dedicate our march and rally to his spirit today. Reverend Walker, presente! All right, so our final speaker is Hanan. Where are you, Hanan? Hanan, you're here. Hanan is a member of the Iraq Veterans Against the War. Please give him your attention, and then when he's done speaking, we're going to start lining up. Thank you. No justice, no peace. U.S. out of the Middle East, no justice. No peace. U.S. out of the Middle East, no justice. No peace. U.S. out of the Middle East, no justice. No peace. U.S. out of the Middle East. We are marching today for jobs, for education. This is the ninth year anniversary of an illegal and immoral occupation of the people of Afghanistan in our names. And we are marching against that today. We have to send a strong message to the current administration, Obama, the Democrats, the fascist Tea Partiers, that we are going to challenge this administration. And we are the majority of America that are against these illegal occupations. We want money for schools. What happened? Have, have people heard about the, the kill team that happened in Afghanistan not too long ago? That is a product of war. That is a product of war. And the thing is, is that the whole war is a, is a crime. And we need to be out here on this anniversary speaking truth to power. And the thing is also, as an Iraq veteran, it's horrible that we're still marching to this day. Nine years, all right? Where's the change? Where is the change? Wall Street's getting the money. Wall Street is getting what they want. What about us, the majority of the people that are suffering here in the United States and abroad? We're here to send a strong message that we need to end this. The other thing, Seattle, is that the right 
the tea partiers and all of them, they're getting so much airtime, right? We see them, they're making all this noise. We need to be out there challenging that narrative, that bullshit, racist narrative that they represent the majority of America, which is not true. Anytime they show their faces, we need to mobilize and regroup. The left needs to regroup right now. Please go back to your communities, go to your schools, go to your churches, go to your workplaces, and talk about the war, these occupations, and make the important connection that if, why in the hell, if we voted for change, why is the current administration spending billions of dollars to kill people abroad when the people here at home need it the most? Let's march today with a strong, unified message that no no more war in Iraq and Afghanistan and everywhere around the world. Let's march! Start lining up over here. Uh, we need some people to help carry. We have these long...
Association Against War and Occupation. We are so glad to be joining with you in your rally here today. An amazing job on, on the part of the organizers to bring people together for this. Um, I wish we could have been with you during the march. We really wanted to be with you guys. Um, Unfortunately, even though we are fighting the same struggle, there is a border between us and being against war and for social justice makes us a prime target for secondary questioning. But we are here, we got through, we made it for the very end. And what I wanted to talk about is how right now of the occupation of Palestine and beyond, we're seeing that we're living in a new era of war and occupation that started with Afghanistan nine years ago, but has continued to Iraq, has continued to new fronts of war in Africa, has continued to the recent coups that we've seen in Latin America, the continued occupation of Palestine attacks against Pakistan and now we're seeing more and more increasing threats against Iran and this is also something we need to be very vigilant about and organizing against a war on Iran and as the governments of these imperialist countries in Canada and the US and other imperialist countries in the world are facing the crumbling of their imperialist capitalist system, their profit-driven system, and their worldwide economic crisis. What are they doing? They're using a band-aid solution. And that comes at the price of the blood of oppressed people worldwide. The exploitation of their markets and labor, their plundering of their resources. So we, standing here today, have come together, and we're not just standing here in Seattle, we're standing around the world in solidarity with oppressed people who heroically are fighting back. In Afghanistan and Iraq, these people are fighting every day against some of the strongest militaries in the world that are occupying their countries. And standing together like we are today, we can and we will and we must win. Right now, as we're seeing Obama sending more troops to Afghanistan, putting more focus of the war drive to Afghanistan, it is even more vital that the anti-war movement in the U.S. and Canada must come together. Because in Canada, Canada has had troops in Afghanistan from the beginning. We have right now 2,800 combat troops occupying Afghanistan, killing civilians, responsible for the torture of detainees, the deaths of many, many innocent people, and holding back the very basic right of self-determination. So it's even more necessary that we come together. And as we come together, we also must defend our rights, our rights to protest, our rights to be against war and fight for a better world. As we've seen with the recent FBI raids on anti-war activists in the United States, we must see this not only as an attack against these anti-war activists, but against the whole anti-war movement around the world. And it's amazing to see so many people in the U.S. who came together against this. And we in Vancouver, too, mobilized in front of the U.S. consulate against the FBI raids. But around the world, we need to come together. We need to fight together. The governments of Canada and the U.S. are working together to oppress people. And we must work together, too to fight for a better world and against war. Thank you very much.
right. And if you'd like to learn more about MAWO, Mobilization Against War and Occupation, they have some newsletters at their table. So it's a great opportunity to network and to meet with our brothers and sisters from Canada. I'd like to call up someone who's going to give us a few remarks. Karen Jones is someone who's worked very hard on this mobilization, probably done more work than any other single individual. She'll be, and she's with Snow, Sound Nonviolent Opponents of War. So please welcome Karen. Hey, um, I just wanted to say that was an awesome march, and I want to borrow a phrase from Mike McCormick. While we stand here in the rain in Afghanistan and Iraq and elsewhere in the world, it's raining bombs and cluster bombs and DU on the people, and we are not going to be silent about this. So if I say it, we will not, we will not be silent. We will not stand by as millions of lives are destroyed and as depleted uranium turns the lands of Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere into the killing field. Trillions of our dollars are being wasted on that. And here in Seattle, we have some wonderful, wonderful peace movements. We have 31 peace vigils every single week in this region. So please join one of those and please let all of us work together and not be silent. Truly, we we are the majority. Only 40% of the people want these wars. We don't want them. We are fighting against this big war machine, the Pentagon. It has quadrupled how much money is being spent, and we want our money back. The bill is due. We want our money back, and we're going to work for it. We will not be silent. Thank you. Alright, so as Karen said, there's something like 31 vigils every week. You can find out about them on the SNOW website or on the Peace and Justice calendar online. Um, there are other upcoming events. We're just going to take a few minutes here to make some announcements. So if you have an event coming up, please come up forward and we can make an announcement. One announcement I'd like to make is that Answer Coalition and Veterans for Peace are co-sponsoring an event that will take place two weeks from today at Bethany United Church of Christ. It is uh, justice for Filipino American veterans. These are the World War II vets who were Filipinos who fought side by side with Americans and were denied equal treatment, equal recognition, and equal pensions. They are filing a class action lawsuit um, that it's been uh, was just recently filed on Thursday, and the, one of the organizers of that will be coming up to speak to us. Many of you may know him, Ago. He used to live here in Seattle, so uh, please come out to learn more about this important issue, a, a struggle against racism and for justice for veterans. So are there other announcements of upcoming events that people would like to make? All right, here we go. Would you like to make a quick announcement? Yes, all right. Uh, on the understanding that the, these wars internationally are connected to the economic crisis, um, uh, Seattle Radical Women is organizing a forum in favor of Initiative 1098, the Tax the Rich Initiative. Right on. And it is going to be Saturday, next Saturday, October 16th at 1 p.m. at the Douglas Truth Library. There's a lot of really good speakers. And also, if anybody is interested in our flyer that talks about the integral relationship between the economic crisis here and the destruction we're wreaking abroad, it looks like this. I'll be over there to hand them out. Thanks. Thank you, Megan. Okay, and um, Edie will make an announcement about a march that's coming up. Hi, um, save the date and stop police brutality on um, the National Day protest on October 22nd. That's Friday after next. Um, join us at Seattle Central at 5 p.m. for a rally and then a march downtown. We'll be at, again, we'll be at Seattle Central Community College on Friday, October 22nd, and thank you. And don't forget, the day after tomorrow, be here at 12 p.m. From 12 to 4, we'll be protesting Columbus Day, this country's celebration of the longest-running occupation in American history, over 500 years. You want to get to the source of the problem of American imperialism? Be here day after tomorrow. If you don't have to work. 
Any other announcements? Any other announcements? We're being outrun by the sirens. Okay, if there are no further announcements, we want to thank everyone for coming out. I think this is awesome turnout, given the weather. Next year, let's, well, hopefully next year the war will be over, but if it's not, let's bring out 10 times as many people. All right, thank you. Time capsule in the underground, I get found it. Time capsule in the underground, I get found it. What about if I didn't want to fight your ugly pointless battle? What about if they could teach you everything you want to know? What about the fact that all this violence breeds violence? It's human nature, now turn friend to foe. What